Before you can create a healthy relationship with others, you first have to create a healthy relationship with yourself. Welcome to Let's Talk About It with your host, Dr. Janie Lacey. Janie is a nationally respected psychotherapist, and on this show, she and her featured guests will help you discover and break patterns in your life that can contribute to self-sabotage and unhealthy relationships. Now, here is Dr. Janie Lacey. Welcome to another episode of Let's Talk About It with Janie Lacey. Oh, The Places You'll Go, the famous book by Dr. Seuss. Well, congratulations. Today is your day. You're off to great places. You're off and away. You have brains in your head. You have feet in your shoes. You can steer yourself any direction you choose. You're on your own, and you know what you know. And you are the guy who will decide where to go. You can be real. You can be fake. You can be. Well, today our guest is going to help us identify and break free from the imposter who takes over your mind. Savon Lewis is a licensed marriage and family therapist. He's a speaker, a corporate consultant. In his private practice, he specializes in working with adults struggling with imposter syndrome. He has been a featured expert for various major television and media platforms, including Oprah Winfrey Network and the Entrepreneur Magazine. As a corporate consultant, he also has facilitated discussions about race in the workplace for different organizations. In addition, he has hosted a series of workshops for A New Direction, which is a London-based nonprofit that provides support and development to individuals that are underrepresented in the creative and digital industries. Without further ado, welcome to the show, Savon Lewis. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. We are so glad that you're here. You know, Savon, on her national book tour for her best-selling book, Becoming, former United States First Lady Michelle Obama spoke about her experience facing imposter syndrome and made an eye-opening revelation about what helped her ease, her insecurities, even admitting that she still has a little imposter syndrome. So you have to help us kick it off by clearly defining imposter syndrome and educating our listeners and our viewers because this terminology can sometimes be a tad bit tricky and you know, help us understand what it is and, and what it's not. For sure, for sure. So I think what we're seeing now is that like a lot more people are kind of becoming aware of imposter syndrome and talking about it more. And so it's kind of showing up in conversations. Uh, I kind of stumbled into it uh, about a year or so ago, uh, kind of just doing the analysis of the clients that I had that I really liked. And they had, you know, a set of circumstances that seemed to be similar. And I kind of delved into it more and kind of came across it myself in that way. Uh, But imposter syndrome is is easily kind of like this. It's where people feel like they are a fraud. Uh, So it's in instances where people feel like they aren't really capable or have the ability even though they've exhibited some ability or mastery over uh, the, the, the task that they kind of set at hand. Uh, so it was coined in about 1978 by uh, Dr. Pauline Clance. She's out of the University of Georgia. And what she found in working with uh, women in, in graduate school was that even though they were getting the grades and they were getting the high marks, that they often felt like they didn't belong or they didn't have really what it took to be successful, even though they were kind of still accomplishing that. And so I think the, the one kind of, uh, I guess, you know, major identifying marker is that it's this feeling of being, you know, a fraud that you're going to be found out at some point. And it's not just like, you know, when you start something new, which is typical and appropriate and normal to say like, hey, I don't know if I really got this. Uh, Imposter syndrome is different because even after you've experienced some success, you really aren't, you know, it really doesn't kind of dissipate uh, that, that feeling of being a fraud. So you still hold on to it so that even though you've got some tangible success and you're able to say like, hey, I did this thing well, you aren't able to say also that I have what it takes to continue to do this thing well. So it kind of resets itself. So then what I'm hearing you say is that if someone, is it a a conscious thought when someone says, you know, wow, I think I'm a fraud. I don't think I know what I'm doing. And I think someone's going to find out. Is that a conscious thought or is that an unconscious thought? How can help us understand that, how that presents in someone's thought process? For sure. So I think it becomes a conscious thought, but it's not stated. Right. So people are living in constant fear underneath the surface and feeling like they are just, you know, tomorrow's going to be the day that people are going to figure out that they've been fooling everyone and they don't really have 
the skills or abilities to be in the position they're in or to be, you know, the, in the relationship that they're in, and they're going to be found out to be a fraud. And so they live in this fear constantly, even though that like, you know, we look around and take a kind of analysis of the evidence that realistically we can tangibly connect the success or, you know, their ability to kind of uh, be in that room uh, to things that they've done and continue to do. But for whatever reason, they're able to try to explain that away and say, well, that's because this other thing happened or it's outside of me, uh, that person's nice to me or they like me or it's easy. Uh, all these things that have nothing to do with their own ability. And so they constantly try to kind of confirm that they don't have what it takes and they just live in this fear uh, kind of constantly. So kind of going back to um, Michelle Obama. So what you're saying when you talk about success, it's not just common folk like you and I. It's uh, successful people. It can be actors, actresses, millionaires, billionaires. Could you speak a little bit about that? Mm -hmm, for sure. So most of my clients are people that are kind of entrepreneurs or doing really well in life. Uh, and so you look at them and, and you and I would kind of say, hey, look, you are amazing. Look at all that you've accomplished. You're killing it in life. But for them, they aren't able to tangibly to connect with that success. So they continue to feel like even though I've done this amazing thing, say I've won a Grammy or, you know, I've made over $5 million this year, that that was luck somehow or that had nothing to do with anything they've done or anything they offer or have. Right. And so they kind of still feel like even though I was able to do that, I don't know that I will be able to duplicate that or keep that up. And so like there's this also this fear of success that kind of I guess is an undertone of that of like, well, if I really don't know what I'm doing and, you know, I've achieved some success, now I'm even more in the spotlight and people are, there's more chance for me to be found out to not really have, uh, you know, what everybody believes uh, I do have or possess. So essentially it can also look like the more success, the bigger, you know, the house or the bigger, the external accomplishments, the more the imposter syndrome can show up internally which then can create more of what I have to lose, so to speak. Yeah, it increases the anxiety, right, around the fact that I'm going to be found out to, to be a fraud. And, you know, the more that we've amassed and the more we feel like we or tell ourselves we fooled people, then the heart of the fall from grace is if mm -hmm. it's, you know, found out to be a fraud. But the real, the real problem is that these people are actually really good at what they do. Uh, they they are, are, you know, equipped to be in the room and they belong in the spaces they're in, regardless of whether or not they believe it. And so it's that lack of belief in self, that self-confidence that's missing uh, that, you know, causes them to have or live in this anxiety or fear around being, being found out to not be something that they absolutely are. So in turn, I'm wondering if that anxiety and fear can also turn into uh, more of a drive where then that drives them to want to accomplish more, want to be more successful and kind of have that almost like a double bind, so to speak. A hundred percent. And I think you hit on something that I think people that struggle with imposter syndrome, is, you know, they find a way to mask it, is that in business or, you know, in their job or career, what you'll see is you'll see this, you know, what looks like hard work, uh, looks like, you know, the overachiever or, you know, putting in the extra hours and those things get rewarded and lauded over, right? Like we say, oh, that's really good. Look at this person there, you know, absolutely putting in the time and effort. And this is why they're so successful and they stay late and you know, it looks like good behavior on the surface, but really what's driving that is this fear that like, hey, I've got to stay late because if I don't, you know, I'm going to make some mistake or I'm going to miss something and I'm going to be found out to have screwed up and, and not, you know, everybody's going to find out that I don't have what it takes. And so they're constantly trying to make sure that they, you know, crossed every, crossed every T, dotted every I to make sure that they aren't going to be found out to be something that, that they aren't. And so it's this living in fear constantly. And it's like, as you're describing it, I almost can feel the anxiety. Right, right, <laughs> it, just, right. it feels such a, an anxious place to be. So, you know, if someone's listening or they're watching us and they're identifying with that, mm -hmm. they can identify with that. What would be some steps that someone can do if they're struggling with imposter syndrome? Like, how do you help your clients through, through this? For sure. So first, I kind of educate them on what imposter syndrome is. Uh, and I talk about some of the stuff that I've found kind of just in my work with this population. Uh, so talking about some of the commonalities. So I ask them about their childhood a bit. And I'll say, you know, sometimes people that I work with had a childhood where they had parents who were super critical of them. And so these mm -hmm. parents kind of constantly pointed out where they needed to improve. And they didn't, weren't really good at also kind of equally sharing where they were doing well. 
And so the message that the, you know, these kids receive and they grow up as adults now is that, hey, you don't have what it takes. There's something inherently wrong with you. Uh, and so you need to kind of be aware of that because obviously your parent was letting you know because they always commented on the thing that you weren't doing well, right? And so, you know, I kind of schooled them to that and like educate them on that piece or talk about other things that I saw. Like, so, you know, it might be someone who, uh, see, I guess, did well in school and did well in their career and they're really successful, but they come from a family where nobody else has done that, right? And so they feel like, well, hey, nobody in my family's really accomplished this. Like, you know, my my, my mom maybe barely graduated high school, my dad, you know, blue collar worker. So I don't know where I got this, you know, I've got this, you know, PhD degree or whatever. Like I, this doesn't really jive with who my family is. So I, I can't really have these skills because no one else in my family has it, right? And so you start to question yourself. And it's these little things that happen over time that make you continue to kind of question whether or not you actually have what it takes. Uh, another example might be someone who, you know, say it's a black person or a person of color, uh, in, in a majority white space and you look around the room and you're like, well, nobody looks like me around the room. So maybe I'm not in the right room. And so you start to question yourself. Right. And I think that that, you know, as I start to talk about those things, something usually resonates with someone and they say like, oh, wait a second. I see what it is. I did have this. And you know what? I've kind of gotten to this place of where now I've created this narrative that for whatever reason, I don't have what it takes. And so I need to be kind of extremely cautious about that. So if somebody is um, a person of color and they're in a predominantly Caucasian school, mm -hmm. then they're looking around and those are some of the thoughts that can float into, into their mind. Um, yep. Would that hinder them from doing the best that they could be? Or does it show up in I'm more driven? What do you normally see in those types of situations? I think I see a little bit of both. Like, I think the thing is that you'll see people be more driven because of the fear and I think the thing I try to latch people onto is the idea of like the driver behind the behavior. So you see the behavior of them being successful and they're getting the mark, but the driver for that is coming from a negative place, this fear that they're going to be found out because they don't have the skills and abilities. Uh, and so it's kind of letting them let go of this negative narrative that they've created about themselves. And I think that's where the other side of the work is about, you know, challenging their beliefs about themselves. Uh, getting them to become aware of that that inner inner narrative that they have that's probably negative about themselves, uh, and then you know making them look for evidence to support that. That you know is there really evidence to support that you don't have what it takes? That usually what I found in life, and I don't think I'm super special in this way, is that like if someone truly doesn't have an ability, you get found out at some point. Like and it's not 30 years later; it's probably a lot sooner if you really don't have the skill set, right? And like the other thing I'll say is like, well, if you're, you know, if you are such a fraud, then, and you haven't been discovered yet, then give yourself credit for being really good at what you do at tricking people. Like just continue to do that and you'll be just fine. And so like, you know, trying to get them to like say, hey, like either you have what it takes or even if you don't, you'll still continue to do a good job of fooling everybody because that's what you've always done anyway. So essentially with imposter syndrome, it's the belief that, I am a fraud are going to be found out, but there's not necessarily legitimacy to that. It's based off of the fear and anxiety. Where the other hand, there really are frauds out there yes. <laughs> in, in yes, that sense. And that's, that's not imposter syndrome. They are just frauds and fakes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> they are trash. They are not really equipped to be where they are. Okay, okay. I want to, name names. <laughs> okay. We just want to get that straight. So if someone's thinking mm -hmm. imposter syndrome, they're not thinking if they are identifying with it, we want to make sure that we distinguish that. <laughs> Sure. I think Michelle Obama talked about one of those individuals recently. <laughs> well, we will go on to the next question. Yes. And, um, you know, my thought, <laughs> my thought um, is, you know, actually, let, let's, let's ask about you, Stevan. How have you struggled with imposter syndrome in, in your own life, being the expert on this subject? Right, right, right. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I even wrote an article that was in a Entrepreneur Magazine about some of that stuff of like, you know, coming up and in, in I've, always been kind of naturally intelligent so things come really easy to me uh so i've ended up being in spaces being a, a black male uh being a therapist and so there aren't a ton of black male therapists uh you know i went my entire graduate program without seeing another uh, black male therapist right uh so you know i'm often in rooms or in spaces where either i'm the first doing it right that looks like me or i'm the only one in the room you know maybe there's another black woman in there but you know usually not uh, and so, you know, I've kind of gotten comfortable 
being in those spaces. But yeah, there's, you know, you end up in a room and you're looking around and you're like, well, where are all my friends? Like, where are the people that look like me? Where, <laughs> what's going on here? Like, I don't know that I am in the right place, but I'm just going to sit quiet and see what goes on. And so I think for me, you know, my kind of saving grace has been that like, I don't allow that to consume me and, and, and freak me out and get me to say like, well, I don't belong. I just say, hey, well, I'm in here. So we're going to make it, you know, do what it do. Well, I would imagine um, in any space that you go into that there's also uniqueness when you look at your full beard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I'm a big guy too, right? Like I'm like six two and a half. <laughs> so like, you know, I kind of take a, I'm going to be noticed, right? So like, you know, I, I can't hide so much. So if, if I'm a fraud, it's going to be found out pretty quickly because everybody's going to see it. You have a presence when you walk in the room. There you go. There you go. There you go. This will clean it up a little bit for you. Right, 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 right. You know, and, and you know, another part of it, and help us, help educate us on this. You know, I'll sometimes hear because of the imposter syndrome that people can have self-sabotaging behaviors. Mm -hmm. How can someone tell if their behavior is self-sabotaging? We hear those terms, yep. but if someone is looking and they're like, okay, I relate with some of this imposter syndrome, like how can we identify, um, or how can they identify if their behaviors are sabotaging potential success? Right, so what I'll usually see when somebody ends up kind of you know, working with me is that they are recognizing that they aren't living to their full potential. Like they become, you know, I guess, you know, readily aware that they can be doing more and that they're holding back because of this fear of being found out to not have what it takes, right? And so, you know, that's whether I don't apply for a promotion that I think I could get, right? Or that I'm, you know, prepared for because I tell myself I don't really have what it takes and I would probably screw up at the next level. So let me just stay here because it's safe. Um, or, you know, whether it's in a relationship and I don't want to go to the next step you know, whether that's by making it more official or, uh, you know, getting married or what have you, uh, or, you know, even having kids, because I don't know that I'm going to be able to do this thing well, and I don't have the confidence in myself to do that. And so what you'll see is people kind of refraining from or recognizing that they aren't living to their full potential, and they know it, and they become like sad about that stuff, right? So oftentimes, they'll show up in my office talking about like, you know, I'm operating on a lot of anxiety, or I'm a bit depressed, and then we start to peel back the layers and we start to notice that, hey, like, here's what's going on. You aren't living to your full potential. You recognize it and you aren't able to kind of do anything about it. And it's frustrating you. So I also hear in that, and I'm wondering if you can speak to that, that I would imagine that some of your clients that are struggling with this can also identify with being a perfectionistic type person. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Absolutely. I mean, that's like one of the kind of five subtypes of, of imposter mm. uh, that's out there. And so like you have the perfectionist. Uh, and so these are people who are really hard on themselves uh, and they, everything has to be perfect or otherwise it's trash. Like there is no middle ground. It's that black or white thinking. And so, you know, I kind of often talk about like where, you know, with my clients where they'll lament over the thing that they didn't do well. And I'm using air quotes, right? That, you know, they, I, I didn't, I didn't do this one thing right. And I you know, have to kind of get them to temper it and say, well, like, did it really take away from the outcome or the quality of everything? You know, it's like you got nine out of 10, you still got an A. Why are we so concerned about this one you got wrong? Like, I don't know that you're defined by that. But for them, they can't let that go because any sense of where they weren't perfect suggests that, yes, I don't have it. It's confirmation now that I don't have what it takes because for whatever reason, they've told themselves or they convinced themselves that everybody else knew this too. And like, so you know, I have to kind of get them to actually talk about like, so did everybody get perfect scores and you're the only one that didn't, you know, help me understand here. Like, let's do a little bit of kind of, you know, logical or rational thinking around this stuff so that you aren't kind of living in this narrative that for whatever reason, everyone around you is being more successful than you are. And so oftentimes you'll find that people will latch on to the, the one person who is super amazing at this one thing and, and they'll say, I'm not that person. And it's like, well, yeah, also nobody else is. So let's stop beating ourselves up. Like, you know, you can't be upset if you don't play as well as LeBron James. It's like, well, yeah, not many people do. So why are we tripping, right? Like, you know, get over it and you're out there and you're playing your own game. So, you know, you're still in the NBA. You're doing good. <laughs> but there's nothing wrong with desiring to play like him. <laughs> yeah, for sure, right? You know, be like Mike, right? But I mean, you know, at the same time, if you're not, that doesn't mean you suck. Okay, okay. yes, that is true. Yeah. That you are performing to the best of your ability. <laughs> right. And your ability is really good. And that's the hard part because it's like they're saying, well, I'm not the best in the league. And it's like, well, if that's the only kind of determinant as to whether you're good or not, then nobody else is good except this one person. Is that what you're telling me? Right. And it's like, well, if that's not true. Then let's allow ourselves to 
you know, give ourselves some compassion and to kind of live in the fullness of who we are, that you are also still really good, even though you may not be the best ever. So then with that being one of the subtypes, mm -hmm. then this, that also to me is a self-sabotaging behavior, according to what you're saying. You're kind of setting yourself up because you're, why would you try something if you can't do it perfectly? <laughs> right, right, exactly. And like, you know, to understand that oftentimes nobody's perfect, like we're not going to be perfect in the things we try. So like trying to accomplish something that is kind of not achievable, you know, and so it's like getting them to, to look at that and, you know, it kind of, I think that's like the beauty of, of, you know, I guess if I use that word right of imposter syndrome is that it shows up differently for different people. So you have that person on the one spectrum who's the perfectionist and then that kind of bleeds over into the other person who might be like the expert. And so this is the person who has to like read everything and, you know, study everything exhaustively to be able to say that they know anything about this subject. Right. And so it's like they've read all the studies, they you know reviewed all the literature and they still they need to do that so that they can feel confident uh, about being able to speak about it. So it'd be like, well, I'm not Dr. Pauline Clance. I didn't come up with imposter syndrome. So what I need to do is I need to read everything she's ever published, everything that's ever been published. And then I need to kind of maybe do my own research for me to be able to talk about imposter syndrome. And it's like, well, I don't know that I need to do all of that in order to say, I can, you know, discuss this stuff or have some, you know, mastery of, over it and ability to support people. Uh, maybe I can do enough and now I, you know, through other skills, I can enhance that and then we can put those together and I can be able to support people. But people with imposter syndrome will say, well, I have to do all those other things and I still may be barely good enough to, to be able to discuss this stuff. Versus there's nothing new under the sun. I can adapt things to my own way right. and my own sweet sauce is going to be what makes it different. And then getting them to self-accept themselves, it sounds like. Exactly, exactly. So, and then with the um, perfectionistic person can they also be the person who is successful yeah yeah i think i think in our society those behaviors get rewarded and that's why we don't recognize that people that the drivers of the behavior are coming from a negative place because that stuff's under the surface because what we do see is that the person does something really well or that they're uh kind of relentless in their pursuit of putting out the best product and we're like oh they're so creative that you know they you spend so many hours on this because it had to be perfect before they put it out. And we're like, they really care about it. Right. And they want to put out good music or whatever it is. And it does, and it ends up being really good, but also like the driver behind that is like, well, if I would have released this other version or if I would have, you know, kind of stopped here, then it wouldn't have been good enough or that, you know, it has to be perfect for it to be good. And it's like, for, mo for me, most things don't have to be a hundred percent perfect for it to be good or worthy. So then it's almost like this, cultural um, adaptation of teaching people to perform an audition and that's how mm -hmm. you get the rewards and accolades and then that kind of has especially for someone that may suffer from imposter syndrome it sounds like to me using your words like a drive it's constantly keeping you in that driver's seat of anxiety and fear <laughs> yep. Yep. yep and you know that inner bully feeds off of that stuff right and so you know it's telling you you aren't good enough or when things happen or don't go the way you expect it which is just a part of life you know people have these kind of unrealistic expectations and so then they really beat themselves up or they go into a depression or, you know, live in anxiety as a result of like this thing that wasn't perfect. And so they kind of, you know, exacerbate it and they say, well, this is, you know, the, the catastrophize this. This is the worst thing ever. And this is going to be so bad. And people know that they, you heard me stumble over my words. Like everybody's going to hear that. And it's like, nobody even heard any, any of that. Like it didn't take away from your message. You're tripping. Uh, but these guys live on that piece of where, you know, it wasn't perfect. So you know, there was this little mix up. And so now people are going to, it's somehow going to now take away from my brand or what people think about me. So you introduced a new term. So you have to expand a uh -oh. little bit for our, <laughs> our viewers and our listeners. You mentioned the inner bully. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Talk yeah, to yeah, us yeah, a little yeah. bit about the inner bully. I uh, want to know if I have an inner bully. <laughs> every, every, I, I think everyone has an inner bully. I hate inner bullies. Uh, so for me, the way I define the inner bully is this, is that uh, the inner bully is that voice inside of us that kind of preys on our insecurities, uh, our, you know, things where we're not doing so well at, uh, our fears, our concerns, and it uses that stuff to beat us up and to make us feel bad, right? So it's just like, you know, a regular bully, you know, makes you want to, makes you want to make you feel terrible and beat you up. And so we're like, if, uh, if I tell people like, say, say I, you know, someone came to me and told me out of nowhere, not a client, and they're like, steve you suck as a therapist. You're terrible. You're horrible. You're trash. You're the worst therapist ever. Right, like I don't know this person. I might brush it off, say, "Hey, man, you don't even know me. We've not ever worked together. 
I care less what you think, you know, uh, hey, you titled to feel that way, but I don't think so, right? There are enough people that I can, you know, discuss in terms of clients that I think I've, you know, assisted and done well and been told such. Uh, but when it comes from inside, we aren't really as good about kind of protecting ourselves from it. And so we just kind of accept it blindly, right? And so like the inner bully, like when it's a voice inside of us and we're like, huh, I feel like I'm not really that good at being a therapist. Like, I don't know if I'm helping people. And, you know, no one's really told me lately, Stevan, that, you know, what you said the other day in session was really so helpful and enlightening. Maybe I'm not really helping people. And I'll start to believe that. And I'll start to second guess myself. And I'm like, you know, the inner bully is really crafty about getting you to believe that stuff or using kind of benign information to make you feel as though, you know, you suck or you're terrible or horrible. It, but it doesn't do a really good job of providing any kind of tangible evidence to support that stuff. So it says it, but there's nothing like that it can say that it can point to concretely. Like, it's like, well, nobody said you were great, so then you must suck. And it's like, well, nobody said I sucked either. So, you know, wh which is it? And so I get people or try to teach people to like, hey, you got to, you know, question your inner book, make it, make it show you proof, you know, look for the evidence. And if it can't provide any, then we got to ignore what it said. So essentially, you're telling us to talk to ourselves. A hundred percent, a hundred percent, in a nice way, though. <laughs> you got to talk to that inner bully and, and shut them up, it sounds like. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. You have to. So then, because we're on that, that subject, and I'm sure someone is uh, relating to that, like, what are some other ways that people can silence that, you know, the inner bully, that negative voice, you know, mm -hmm. and I read a study out of the University of Cambridge that said 69% of our thoughts are automatically negative. Yep. So we have all of that stuff going up against us. How do we fight that inner bully and, and kick their butt? <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I tell people that like, you know, the people I work with that I'm relentless about language. So I try to make people aware of like how they are talking to themselves so that they're clear about what they're saying. Um, and this came, comes from, you know, me, early in my career, uh, being at Santa Monica College and, you know, studying some Deborah Tannen, she's a linguist out of Georgetown, and, you know, really kind of paying attention to language. And so, like, when people are using words that are negative towards themselves to explain an event or something they did, their own behavior, I'm, like, relentless about making them aware of that stuff. So I think, you know, first you got to kind of be aware of, like, how you're talking to yourself, because words have power, right? And, you know, people say sticks and stones break bones, but no, words hurt you, right? And so you can be really mean and ask to yourself, and it can make you feel terrible. Uh, and then the other thing is like, I get people to engage in kind of more objective activities to, to be able to help them see how others see them. Uh, so, you know, part of that might be, I have a, an activity I do called collecting data where, you know, you kind of check with a few people to kind of see what your uh, top five strengths are and how they see them. And, you know, I kind of put it in the table. And so that way you can kind of objectively see like, hey, these five people who don't really know each other that I know in various capacities, are kind of saying a lot of similar stuff about me, it must be true, right? And so kind of, again, looking for that evidence to support that who I am is kind of, you know, out there and it's not like based on some kind of fraudulent behavior or, you know, not you're being something that you're not. So you're literally going to people close to you and you're asking them and soliciting feedback. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. So I'd make people do a swath of you know, their, their kind of ecology. And so, you know, you might take your mom, you might take a brother or sister, uh, you might take your spouse or partner, uh, you might take your best friend, but you also might take a coworker that knows you. And you might take someone that you've known for, you know, uh, three months, and you might also take somebody that you've known for 15 years, right? And so it's like, hey, if all these different people that you know in different capacities are saying pretty much the same, like things will come out, then this is, this, you got to accept who you, this is who you are, unless you're saying all those people are liars. Okay, so then a part of you have to actually believe the feedback mm -hmm. that they're getting. And then part of the trick that I'm hearing as far as the homework goes for your clients is that it's individual people and they're doing it individually. And then they're mm -hmm. getting, as you use the word, collectively taking yep. that data. And then it's like, okay, well, these people right. know me in different capacities, but they're saying the same thing. So there's mm -hmm. probably some truth to that. 100%. That's exactly how I operate. Well, that sounds like some good homework that uh, those that are listening and those that are watching can probably just do, do tonight or do in the next, next day and don't necessarily have to be suffering completely from the imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are enjoying this conversation as we are learning and almost taking the mirror and looking at ourselves to understand that little inner bully that we may all have. Yep. So we uh, appreciate you being with us today, Stevon. So we are going to take a short commercial break and we're going to be back and we're going to talk a little bit more about sabotaging our success. We'll be right back let's talk about it with Janie Lacey are you often attracted to unavailable partners feel like you can't stay but can't leave a toxic relationship obsessed with thinking about a current or former lover 
Feel resentful that you're always taking care of the other person? The Woman Redeemed Therapy Program is for women who want to break free from toxic relationship patterns so they can find the love they truly deserve. This program is a safe, nurturing environment, essential for building self-worth and acquiring the tools to work through challenges and create your best self. We invite you to begin the journey today to start building the new you. Call 407-622-1770 or visit LifeCounselingSolutions.com. That's LifeCounselingSolutions.com. You are listening to Let's Talk About It with Dr. Janie Lacey. To reach the show today, please call into 1-888-346-9141. That's 1-888-346-9141. You may also send an email to Janie at lifecounselingsolutions.com. Now back to Let's Talk About It. Let's talk about it with Janie Lacey. We are talking about that inner bully and the imposter syndrome so that we can stop sabotaging our life and get on with our life to fulfill our purpose. So welcome back to the show, Stevan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I want to um, know from you, how can someone that's listening or watching recognize, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll see this um, in my own practice, when they are more comfortable with being in the struggle, I call it almost being addicted to the struggle towards mm-hmm. success versus really being and working towards being successful. How can someone recognize that when, again, it kind of goes back to what we mentioned before break, and that's the self-sabotaging behaviors. Right. But when people are struggling, and I kind of think about it in the terms of um, when people may have a deprivation mindset that they feel like part of the struggle is part of what they need to go through. And, and I would love to kind of get your expertise on that and how that all plays into the imposter syndrome. Yeah, I think that people will often kind of equate that you know they've got to suffer or that success has to be painful for them to be able to do well or you know we got to go through some adversity. Uh, I, I do think that we've got to get uncomfortable to grow, but I don't know that we have to be painfully uncomfortable to grow. Mm. Uh, and I think that's a little bit of the difference for me. Uh, so I think like when people are self-sabotaging, it's like maybe they're trying to avoid the painful part or you know they're uncomfortable with the the being uncomfortable. Uh, and I think that's where growth comes from. But you know, I also see a thing of where people will try to, I guess, they're, what I call is a twisted kind of understanding of like, you know, success and humility. Uh, so it's like people are successful, but they don't want to talk about it. Uh, and I don't, that doesn't, I don't understand that beat, right? Like, and so it's like, you know, not wanting to kind of say that, hey, I did this thing really well, or that I've accomplished this thing. And they, you know, under the guise of I'm trying to be humble, right? And so for me, like humility is not really you know, not talking about your success. It's like not making people feel less than because you are successful, right? And so, you know, I think that there's like, this something happens to us when we don't acknowledge that we've done something well, we tend to feel like we aren't doing things well. And so I think it's really important to be able to acknowledge that stuff because it will lead to, like you said, more of that self-sabotage is that if I don't feel like I'm doing well because I'm not acknowledged that I'm doing well, then I'm not going to be, you know, motivated to go and try to, you know, accomplish more or seek out new opportunities or, you know, put myself out there to be seen or more visible because I don't have this belief that I have what it takes. So humility, what I heard you say, it's okay to talk about your successes. It's okay to toot your own horn, but Mm -hmm. where it gets to a dysfunctional or hurtful place, what I heard you say is when you're doing it um, to uplift yourself and pushing other people down. Right. Right, right. I think that's the, the part that people want to avoid. And I'm, I'm there with you, right? Like, I don't think we need to make people less than because you are good at something. But I don't think it also serves a good purpose to not talk about what you're good at. And so for me, I was like, if it's, yeah, I guess I try to put it in things that are, you know, more objective, right? That can't be, you know, kind of argued against so much. So it's like, if I made, you know, 10 three-pointers, I did that. I don't know that I need to pretend like I didn't right? Like I made 10 three-pointers. That's, that's just fact. But what I don't need to do is say like, oh man, you suck because you made eight. Like I don't need to say that. I can just say like, hey, I made 10 three-pointers. I had a great game, you know, shot felt good and, and we're okay to go. Uh, I, I don't need to put other players down and call them trash because I did well. You know, and I'm so glad that, that you're bringing that up in this topic because what it reminds me of, Stevan, is I see it on social media, actually, you know, so on social media where people have to celebrate their successes, but they have to also have the, the, um, 
they're also poking at someone who's not as successful as them. Well, mm -hmm. you know, if, if you were, if you were doing this, then you would get this. And, and I always felt like you can celebrate your success, but you don't have to put out other coaches or other speakers or other whatever we can fill in the blank. And sometimes those to me are kind of remind me of just passive aggressive mm -hmm. um, posts. And I personally, when I see people do that, my mind, obviously being a psychotherapist is going to what insecurity are you really <laughs> are struggling with that you can't just focus on your own success without having to put other people down. Exactly. Exactly. Right. That culture of comparison. And it's like, well, I need to not only compare myself to others, but I need to compare myself to be better than others. And, you know, like you said, it's like to, to, to make myself feel better or to kind of elevate myself, I'm pointing out the flaws of another person or trying to put this other person down to elevate or lift myself up. And I think that's unnecessary. I think, you know, I put a post out the other day about like the bread, bread aisle analogy, right? That there's enough, you know, if you walk down the, in the grocery store and you go down the, the bread aisle, you'll see there's a ton of types of bread, right? And the idea is that like, there's so many kinds of bread because they all have space to exist, right? And that's why they're all on the shelf. And so no, no one, you know, type of bread is right for everyone. And so it's like, you know, you don't need to tear down somebody else, just do what you're doing and you'll be fine kind of in that and just own it. You uh, nicely and eloquently uh, repackaged that, <laughs> the culture of comparison. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so yeah, so uh, yeah. thank you for nicely packaging that from Janie's Plain Talk. <laughs> so <laughs> <what> I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I appreciate that. So, you know, with saying that, how can operating in imposter syndrome hold people back from truly walking in their purpose? You know, I'm a, a big believer. I always say to people that, you know, me personally, I want, I want to die empty, right? I want to give everyone um, all the, the things that are part of my purpose. So how can that hold people back from walking in their purpose? And what can they, can they do about that today, now, if they're hearing this message? Well, I think part of it is that, one, the reason it holds people back is because, again, that lack of belief in self right? That like, I don't go out and promote myself to be such or try to sow into people because how can I help or assist or teach somebody else if I don't know what I'm doing, right? And so I think that that prevents people from kind of engaging with others in a way that they're going to be supportive or can have impact in their life because they've already adopted this, you know, inaccurate narrative about themselves of not having what it takes or that, you know, I'm a fraud. And so if I, you know, try to teach this person this thing or, you know, support them, they're going to find out that I really don't know what I'm talking about and therefore I'm going to look like an idiot. Uh, and then I think the other side of that, or like the, I guess, kind of to the second part of your question is that people need to, I think, be, be objective, right? And so like, you know, kind of temper their expectations and how hard they are on themselves and also kind of give credit to other people that, you know, most everyone we encounter isn't an idiot. And so that if, you know, people are, for the most part, pretty good judges of character. And so that if you really didn't have what, what, it, what it took or you were really an imposter or fraud, that somebody somewhere would have kind of already identified that at some point, right? Like, I, I don't think that unless you're, again, you could be that good of an actor that you can fool everybody, but then that, that goes back to my other point of like, well, then just keep doing that, then nobody will ever know, right? But I think really what it is, is that, you know, people encounter you, they interact with you, and what they found is that you are genuine and that you really have the abilities or skills. Uh, and so they've determined that already. So just kind of, even if you aren't constantly feeling it immediately, kind of accept that like, hey, at least I trust that this other person isn't an idiot. And so I think that they might know something or they would have been able to recognize if I really didn't have what it took. So I hear a couple things. And one of the things um, I want to go back to something you had mentioned earlier. So when someone is discovering their purpose and they're looking at all the things that preventing them from getting there, part of that is understanding the root system of how that's originated in their life. And mm -hmm. It's not never to it's not ever to blame their childhood or to blame their parents, but it's to understand how they were formed and how these thoughts and types of things templated them. So that's my understanding. So I'm I'm wondering just how important is that for them to understand that root system and to connect those dots so that those things can now be worked on in the process of therapy or process in their self improvement process so that they can truly walk in their purpose. Sure. And I think, I think it's really important, right? Like when we talk about parents and the impact they had on us, like the, I don't think parents were bad. I mean, there are some bad parents out there that are you know, <laughs> doing that stuff, right? But I don't think most people had parents who were intentionally trying to hurt them or impact them negatively, but that's kind of what happened that mm -hmm. the parent who was super critical wanted you to be the best version of yourself, right? Like I can, you know, pretty much kind of reframe that and say their intent 
was to help you kind of be the best version of yourself. The impact was negative, right? The, the consequence of that was that now you kind of question whether you have what it takes to, to, to kind of be in spaces, right? So, and it's getting them to kind of recognize that like, while this happened, you don't also have to continue to live with that belief, right? And so getting them to be aware of like, hey, you're holding on to this and this is what's, you know, preventing you from kind of reaching your full potential or be your full self. Is it really serving purpose for you to kind of continue to operate based on this narrative or should you adopt a new narrative, one that's more fitting for who you really are? So the, to, to reiterate, it's parents are doing the best that they can. And sometimes mm -hmm. the injury is unintentional in the sense mm -hmm. that, you know, I always think of the example of, you know, the child that comes home and I, and I'm very um, conscious of it in my own parenting is that when they're coming home and they don't have all the A's, right. To not focus mm -hmm. on the B or the C because the small cuts along the way, so to speak, the small injuries can be implanting in that child. They're not good enough unless it's perfect. And sometimes that's how that can manifest um, in our childhood versus a parent really trying to be hurtful to your point. It can be unintentional mm -hmm. um, and it can be very small things along the way. So it's important, I think, for people to know that, you know, it's, 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 we, everyone can make those types of um, injuries in parenthood or even with their friends because most people, to your point, want the best for others. So, and that can be where their intentions are coming, but it can still have a negative effect. Yes, that's very well said. <laughs> I'm learning, I'm learning from the best here. Get an A, that's exactly what I was trying to say. <laughs> so I got the, I got the perfect A. <laughs> yeah, you did. Yeah, you did. So then uh, another thing I also heard you say, talking from the other side of things, people who are truly a fraud or truly fake and phony, uh, just yeah. Janie's plain talk, <laughs> yeah, is uh, is that if they also can get collective information, not necessarily the way that you intend your homework assignment, but if you're looking at someone's life and they're constantly losing friends or they're constantly changing groups and they themselves are probably getting the same reaction or perhaps the same negative responses, there could be something to that versus, um, so we, that could also work on the negative side if someone's looking at someone's life or wanting to be a part of someone's life to look at their processes or how they've handled certain things along the way. Is that kind of what I'm hearing you say? For sure. Yeah. That like, you know, if we're going to model ourselves after somebody, like we should be able to kind of, you know, I guess objectively, again, evaluate some of their, their processes and success. And, and we try to take the good and not, not make somebody like, you know, deity level that they're perfect, but, you know, also recognizing that people that have flaws doesn't mean that they're, you know, flawed per se. So I guess it's like the, the, the idea of, you know, can, can someone be, you know, can a good person do bad things? Right. Or, you know, so, you know, the analogy I use when I'm working with clients is, you know, if I'm driving and I run into the back of somebody, does that mean I'm a bad driver? Right. Like, you know, maybe I did a bad thing. Like I hit this person's car and I've got to also make up for it and pay for theirs to get fixed and mine fixed. But also, I don't know that I need to have my license taken away as a result of that. And so I think, you know, kind of as we evaluate people and evaluate kind of their their process and how they're going to be going, going through life, like we don't need to kind of so, I guess, strictly adhere to the way they're doing it and determine that they are perfect, they're doing everything right, that, you know, some people kind of are, aren't getting results and we can see they aren't getting results. And that might be uh, due to kind of how they are operating, even though they're wanting to tell you how you need to do things better. Or that like, if somebody is, does something well, that doesn't mean that they're actually really great at it, right? You know, I mean, I use a lot of sports analogies. So, you know, anybody in the NBA can probably have like a 40 point game. That doesn't mean that they're consistent, you know, 30 players, or for your know, 40 point per game score, right? Like there are very few of those. And so it's like, you know, is that person having a good game or are they really good at it? So essentially what I'm hearing you say <laughs> is if you want to learn how to make a million dollars or if you want to learn how to make $5 million, learn from somebody who's already done that and has the receipts to prove it. <laughs> right, right, exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah, and as long as the receipt <laughs> wasn't like a lottery ticket, because it's like, <laughs> That's you know, true. Uh, they, that they is true. Five million, but also, <laughs> I don't know that they could reproduce that. Maybe they can, but I doubt. It. Good point there. So, yeah. how did they make the five million? So, ask That's the why true. question. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. They can teach you how to scratch off those numbers, maybe. <laughs> hey, if, if, hey, that might be a skill. I do not have it. If they have it, teach me. You know, I want to. I want to win. So a gambler, so to speak, they can't necessarily teach another person how to gamble and to win because really it's a luck of the draw. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly my point. 
So then, um, so then what can someone do today, today mm -hmm. that they can start turning their life around? They're listening to us, they're watching us, or they're going to listen to us at some point um, in their life. What mm -hmm. can they do, whatever they're listening to this message, to start turning their life around and to start walking in their strength and their power, especially now they've become aware, okay, I have the imposter in me, I got mm -hmm. the inner bully, I got to start doing all these types of things, and I want to walk in my full strength and my full power. What does Stavon right. tell us? Tell us. I guess the, the one kind of, if you can do anything today, I would say people should start to operate in a place of gratitude. So what I find is that oftentimes people will focus on the things they aren't doing well and spend an unequal amount of time doing that. And they spend very little time focusing on what went well or what went right, right? And so I think that what I would have them do is at the beginning of the day or the end of every day, kind of either, you know, at the beginning of the day, say, hey, what did I do yesterday that really went well and give yourself gratitude for that, right? Or if it's at the end of the day, you want to do it, say, hey, I did this today that was well, let me kind of reflect on the things I did well. Like if you can just start making a habit of that, a daily practice of showing gratitude or keeping a gratitude journal, I think that will, you know, change your life uh, tremendously. Okay, very practical and very simple. And any of us can start doing that. Mm -hmm. So then how does imposter syndrome show up in romantic relationships in particular? What would you tell us? Yeah, so I mean, it's kind of the, the same thing of where people might feel like they don't deserve the partner they have because they know this you know, thing about themselves that makes them not you know, deserving of their partner. And so they might you know, do things to kind of, you know, they might make statements of like, you know, I don't deserve you or you're too good for me you know, all these sorts of things that sound like, you know, they really appreciate the other person, but it's really them or that inner really kind of coming out saying like, hey, this person doesn't feel that they are worthy of being in relationship with you. And it's probably going to lead to some issues later on. Um, but, you know, part of me says like, well, if you were truly a horrible partner, then I would say most people don't stay in relationship with people that are terrible. Or if they do, it's not for very long, hopefully, right? Like, I know there are situations when obviously that happens, like, you know, DV and stuff like that. I was going to say that can happen a lot. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, Trauma absolutely. bond. <laughs> right, right, right. And, and I mean, it's some of that is to like know that that person isn't great, but like also not having a safe way to get out of that is something different. Uh, but I'm talking about like where, you know, the person is saying like, hey, I, I don't deserve this person or that, you know, I'm telling myself I'm not really, you know, going to be a good husband or a good wife or a good partner or whatever. And it's like, well, yo, if the person, if the other person doesn't see it, right, or if you're meeting their needs, why can't you accept that, right? Like maybe sometimes we put expectations on what somebody else deserves because we hold them in high esteem and we say that we aren't able to give them everything they, they need. And, but if the other person doesn't feel that way, then I don't know that it truly matters, right? Like if I've determined that you're enough for me, why is that not okay? So essentially the person can be struggling internally that, using your words that they're not good enough in mm -hmm. that sense and they're struggling with that internally and i can see that 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 would sabotage the relationship because to your point if their partner is saying i love you the way that you are you're enough for me you don't have to do a b or c you don't have to perform an audition for my love mm -hmm. uh, but if they're struggling with that and they're not necessarily conscious of it in the sense of they're working through it i can see how that can um be draining in a relationship for sure, for sure. Of, you know, having to attend to someone who's constantly saying they aren't good enough when you determine that they are and, you know, them needing a lot more reinforcement or, you know, maybe it starts to show up as jealousy or, you know, being concerned like, hey, you're out. You must be cheating on me because you aren't here. And it's like, no, nah, I already said you were good enough. There's no need for me to kind of do any of that stuff. Yes, you said it so nicely. They just need more reinforcement. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> so I want to uh, pivot back to um, a certain area. I know we talked about like celebrities and successful mm -hmm. people, but you know, when we just look at the high achievers of the world where they don't necessarily have to be a millionaire, but they um, mm -hmm. like achievements, they like accolades, those types of things. In your opinion, why do we see, or at least from my understanding, why do we see imposter syndrome more in the high achievers of the world? Because I think like once you get to a place of where you're doing really, really well, there's very kind of small, I guess, distances between, you know, someone being amazing and somebody being better, right? And so those little, little differences or the little things matter a lot more. Uh, so you think about it in terms of like, you know, I do cycling. So, you know, if you're talking about like cycling, like, you know, we're talking about seconds between being first and 
and, you know, like being, you know, on the podium and winning gold and, you know, being off the podium and not even placing and getting a medal, right? And so like when we're putting that level of pressure on ourselves, then, you know, we're saying, well, everything matters. Everything matters so much, right? And so I think people are living under that kind of intense scrutiny. And then I think also like when you're doing well, it's hard to kind of gauge whether or not people are really, you know, into you or into the things you or what you represent, right? And so I think we start to then question whether the sincerity or, you know, the genuineness of, of what people's relationships are with you, you know, it, whether that's coming from a place of them saying, hey, I like you, steve because of who you are, or is it because I like you, steve because you're on Janie's show? So uh, thank you for the plug. <laughs> so when you talk yeah. about the representative, <laughs> what I also hear in that in under the umbrella of the imposter syndrome is that if someone is a high achiever, let's say when they're dating or they're um, going for a job, they're going to put necessarily their representative there, so to speak. And then I can imagine sometimes um, the double-edged sword is when the real person shows up that they can probably be harder on themselves if they're feeling like they have to constantly keep up with the mask or the representative or this facade, all those types of things. Could you speak to that? Yeah, because it's that pressure again to be perfect, to be this thing that everybody or you've told yourself everybody has grown accustomed to. And it doesn't give you place to be human. And I'm saying like, you know, everybody can is allowed, I think, in my opinion, to have an off day, uh, you know, to maybe have an off week or that life happens and, you know, we don't feel up to it and that's okay. But sometimes when you're in such a high functioning position or, you know, a position that's out front being, being a celebrity or what have you, that you aren't given that level of grace or you don't feel like you have that level of grace. And so we put this pressure on ourselves that we have to be, you know, and that's another type of imposter, right, is the, the superhero, that we have to be all things to everyone. And it's like, well, when are you attending to your own needs? Because it sounds like you're neglecting yourself and trying to be everything to everyone else. So it sounds to me a close cousin of the imposter syndrome can also be a codependent. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, 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 yeah. Now you start a bad C word. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But that's, Absolutely. that's that, you know, you're cold, but you give the sweater to everybody else, right? And if mm -hmm. that's the representative that you put out there is I'm the caretaker and, yeah. and I love to help other people that that can be harming in that sense. For sure that I can handle everything. I don't need help. I can help everybody else. And, you know, you're doing that while you're neglecting your own needs. And then you get to a place of where it's no longer sustainable. And then you start to feel like a failure. And it's like, well, wait a second, you weren't doing anything to kind of, you know, invest in yourself to kind of make those emotional deposits uh, that you needed to be able to kind of continue on. Why would you think that you would be able to carry on forever? It's almost like the same thing that happened when the pandemic hit of like people, you know, saying, well, ah, I'm not doing this, I'm not doing that. And it's like, yeah, we're in a pandemic. Like, why, why, why would you still be expecting to be functioning at normal levels? Like we are not in a normal situation. It's okay that you aren't you know, working out every day or you're not motivated to do this or you're stress eating, like give yourself some compassion. It's okay and give yourself some compassion. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, so Steve-On, in our last um, couple of minutes, you know, we got to touch on this because, you know, many researchers believe that the closest opposite of the imposter syndrome is the Dunning-Kruger effect. And we're seeing it more than ever with the Instagram influencer effect. <laughs> so can you uh, speak to this and how can people weed out the frauds in today's Insta success culture? Right, so like when you're talking about that, you're talking about that uh, kind of effect of where people are, are incompetent and you know, aren't able to see that they're incompetent in a thing. Uh, and I think because social media is what it is, it gives everyone a platform. Uh, and so I think that because everybody has a platform doesn't mean that they have something to say. And so we've got to do our due diligence to make sure that, you know, things line up, that as people are talking about things, you know, what, what have they done? Where's the research? Where's the, you know, uh, education they have, the experience? Like, you know, anybody can pick up a, a, a iPhone or, you know, cell phone or whatever and turn it on and then start press record and then start talking about any number of topics after they've looked at Wikipedia. That doesn't make them an expert. Uh, we should also kind of look for some tangible evidence in their lives that they're getting the results that they are also telling you you can get from whatever they're talking about. You know, like what makes somebody an expert? So essentially, we have to ask questions. We have to do our research, our due diligence. We have to vet people and yeah. not look at just because someone says they are, or they put it out there to believe everything we see in here, if, if that's what I'm hearing you say. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> you know, it, it reminds me of the joke of like, you know, if, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, 
you know, it may not be a duck, but, you know, it better not be outside during, you know, duck season. So, you know, we've got to do our little bit of kind of due diligence to make sure what we are looking at and seeing is lining up with what's behind the scenes. So, you know, like as an example, you've got all these letters after your name and degrees and certifications. Uh, it's pretty safe to say that you know what you're doing. Well, why thank you. <laughs> Well, we certainly appreciate you. Thank you for breaking down imposter syndrome. And I am hopeful that people will find hope and inspiration that they can do something if they relate to all the things that you share with us. So thank you so much, Savan. You know, um, oh, the places <laughs> you'll go as you dream and focus on the path you choose that will lead to your own destiny. Put in the work and believe in yourself as there will be bumps along the way, even if you are afraid. Because to love oneself is to set and practice self-care so you can be your best self who can show up every day and perform out of your overflow instead of your empty cup. So until next time, remember, you may have an imposter moment, but you don't have to have an imposter life. This is your host, Janie Lacey. Thank you for tuning in. Let's Talk About It can be heard live every Wednesday at 5 p.m. Pacific Time and 8 p.m. Eastern Time on the Voice America Empowerment Channel. Please join your host, Dr. Janie Lacey, for another edition of the show next week.